Hey, hey, it is Zenial Gamer, and today we're going to be talking about some common mistakes that people make with BJR5. Uh, now, I apologize. I know there's no motion in the background. In order to start this video, I thought it would be good if we just went step by step with um, exactly how BJ5 works. So we're gonna go through, I took some stills of each part of the fight, and we're gonna go through step by step exactly how a perfectly functioning BJ team should work. And then we'll get some video animations in the background. And then we'll talk about, um, I think I've got eight of the most common mistakes. And a lot of the reasons, the, they're very small mistakes, but they still cause fails. And I think a big part of the reason those mistakes happen is because they just don't really know exactly how the team is supposed to function and why each thing matters. So you can see in the background right now, the boss is uh, attacking my team. And that's how the BJ run is going to start. The boss attacks your team. This particular attack does not strip. However, it can sometimes give oblivion. So the first thing you'll notice is that my Dagora my Lauren, my Belager, and my Colleen each have will runes. It's a common misconception that Colleen does not need will runes. In theory, if you had a big enough, and I mean a huge speed gap between Colleen and Lauren, then maybe you could get away with a third fight set, but the worth, the risk is just not worth it. So this is our first step. The boss attacks us. Our second step now is that our Dagora and our leader skill both die. Belager gets his stacks and goes to five. And then on this still, this is the third action in the fight, Colleen is gonna go with her heal and attack buff, and we need the attack buff. Colleen will always go, like the perfect AI method, Colleen will always go as long as there's a monster at 30% or below health. So we need Dagora to resurrect to force Colleen to do her attack buff. And that's why we have to have, going back to this first still, that's why we have to have runes on the Dagora. So our, First thing that happens is the boss attacks us. The second thing that happens is our Belager gets his stacks. The third thing that happens is Colleen goes. This is actually our first action, our first monster. So Colleen's our fastest monster. Colleen goes with attack buff. After that, our Lauren will defense break. And then our Belagers will unload. Now this will cause the boss, if all the Belagers have enough damage, this will cause the boss to drop to 50% health, and the boss will do the jump, and the boss will come back around after the jump and kill our Dagora again. Now, Colleen is supposed to be at 10,000 effective HP, and there's a lot of ways to get to that. The guides show like she needs X amount of HP and X amount of defense, and honestly, that's, that's important that the guides show that, because it's hard for some people to calculate effective HP. But the reality is it doesn't matter if it's all HP added, all defense added, as long as she's at 10,000 effective HP, give or take like a very little bit, then you're good. Why does that matter? because we can't have Colleen die on the initial boss hit. If Colleen were to die on the initial boss hit, she wouldn't be there to attack buff us. However, she must die on the boss jump in order to restack our Belager. So when Colleen, uh, well actually there's two reasons she must die on the jump, I apologize. One is to restack our Belager. Two is because of Jansen's uh, resurrect skill. So if you look at the text of Jansen's resurrect skill, and we'll do that later in this video, but he adds 30% attack bar to each living ally for each ally that he resurrects. And so we need the Colleen to be dead and be resurrected in order for him to give enough attack bar to your Belager and Lauren to push them ahead of the boss. So after the Jansen does his resurrect, the Laurens are, well, this is the Jansen resurrect slide, sorry. So after the Jansen's does, Jansen does his resurrect, the Laurens are gonna break the attack, uh, excuse me, break the defense of the boss again and then the Belagers are going to unload and finish off the boss. Now, that all seems pretty straightforward, but there's actually a lot of speed tuning mechanics that are critical, and there's a lot of key thresholds that are critical. And so we're going to go through from here, I'm going to get uh, some video playing in the background, and we're going to go through and talk about what some of the most common mistakes people make are. Okay, so what are the most common mistakes that people make when building their BJ5 teams? Now, I have not done a survey. I don't know exactly like how many people screw this thing up and screw that thing up. Um, but these are just the things that I've seen, like when we take normals and channel 65, things like that. These are the things I see that either cause runs to fail or cause them to be a little bit slower. 
Uh, so before, it, uh, one thing to mention right off at the start, you can always tell if something's wrong with somebody's team if you're not getting times in the 27 second range. If you see a time that comes out even at 28 seconds, it usually is an indication that something is wrong somewhere on one of the teams. So when we bring in, um, when I when I go with like randoms in, in channel 65, I usually just take a look at the Belagers to make sure that they've got enough damage. And then after the first run, I take a look at the time. And if the time is in that 27.2 to 27.8 range, then I know we're good. And if it's over that, then I know there's probably something wrong with one of the teams and I'll go take a look at them. So one of the more common things I see is something I spent a bit talking about at the start of this video, so I won't spend too much more time on it, but it's not having the correct will runes in the correct places. So just as a reminder, you should have will runes on everybody except for your Jansen, who does not need will, he's just triple fight, and your leader. Whichever leader you're using should also be triple fight. Number two on this list is maybe the most important one. You don't see this as often, but when you do, it causes a lot of runs to fail. And that's making your Jansen too slow. There is absolutely a floor to how slow your Jansen can be. Uh, I believe that floor is plus 27, which is why mine is exactly at plus 27. Somebody out there might argue and say it's plus 26 or plus 25. Uh, I've never tested it. I can't swear to you that it's exactly 27. What I know for sure is that 27 is what was posted on the original guides and 27 has always worked for me. Now, why does that matter? Because if your Jansen is too slow, then the boss will cut between Belager and Jansen. So what'll happen is the boss will do its jump, which we want it to do, but then the boss will immediately get a second attack. Now it may not kill anything. So some people are, if you raid with somebody and their Jansen is slow, they're gonna tell you, well, I've done a lot of runs and I've never had a problem. You might have passed a lot of runs, but when the boss cuts between Belager and Jansen, that second attack gives it the opportunity to strip. And it can strip the attack buff from your Belager, it can strip the immunity from your Belager. A lot of bad things can happen. Additionally, and this is going to tie into a mistake later, it could also wind up killing your Belager. So it's really important that all of your monsters go in the correct turn order. Okay, the next mistake I see people make is using a six-star monster for their leader skill. So you can see here we've got our Kali. She's three-star. Does she need to be awakened? No. I awaken my leader so that I don't make a mistake in storage. That's the only reason. What matters is that she's using crap runes so that she has no added HP, no added defense, and she's going to die right away. Now, why can't you use a six-star monster? Well, let's take a look at what a default six-star unruned... For example, I think I have an unruned Pungbeck, right? So let's find her. Him. Him. I'll never get over the pioneers being men. They, they look like women to me. So let's say I wanted to use Pung as my leader skill. 24% crit rate is better than 19, right? But my Pung is six starred. Even with no runes on at all, I've got 12,000 HP and 500 defense. Now, just to compare it to our Colleen, my Colleen, whose effective HP is 10,000, survives the initial boss hit. My Colleen has 8,800 HP and 460 defense. My Pung has 12,000 HP and almost 600 defense. Even though Pung is completely unruined, he will not die on the initial boss hit. So what happens if that Pung doesn't die? Well, a lot of people will say it's no big deal, I can use a six star, it doesn't matter if they die because Belager's gonna get stacked anyway. This is true. When the Dagora dies, Belager gets three stacks. He started with one from Will, and he's gonna get three, uh, well, excuse me, one more stack from Colleen. So your Belager will get five stacks. There's a couple of things though. One is that your uh, Belager animation will be slower than my Belager animation. So it's kind of a, an odd sounding thing, but the Belager animation is faster when two monsters die or two or more monsters die than when one monster dies. In very rare circumstances, this can cause us to go out of sync to where uh, my Lauren and the other person's Lauren 
will act after the jump. And if they both miss their defense breaks, our Belagers may go before your Lauren goes. And that would cause us to lose. So basically what we're doing is there's a small chance that we're going to miss uh, a defense break and we don't have your Lauren there as a backup. So that's one thing. Another thing is it changes, and this is the much bigger thing, the thing that's consistently going to mess you up. It changes how many monsters Jansen is resurrecting. Because if your Pungbake doesn't die, Colleen is now going to heal it a little bit more. And remember, that Pungbake's effective HP is higher than my Colleen's. My Colleen has to be at 10,000 to die on the jump. That means your Pungbake has to be at 10,000 effective HP to die on the jump. If it doesn't die on the jump, that's one less monster for Jansen to resurrect, which is 30% less attack bar for your Belager and your Lauren. And that screws all the turn order up completely. So when you use a six-star monster as your leader skill, you will cause the occasional fail because the turn orders change after the jump. Okay, the next most common mistake is Belager is not tanky enough. And this is kind of a small thing. I'm Well, this is a big thing, but there's a small margin is what I was trying to say. The guides all tell you Belager should be at 85,000 effective HP. This is true. I would recommend going to 86 or 88,000 just to create a little bit of buffer, but 85,000 is the recommended. If you are right on the edge, it's important to put your Jansen on the front line. It will reduce the damage that your Belager takes, or more specifically, it prevents the front line from getting wiped out and then having the boss hit the back line sooner, causing your Belager to take more damage. Now, a lot of people, I don't even, to be honest, I can't even figure out why people want to put Jansen on the back line. I don't know if it's supposed to be a status thing, or maybe they just copied somebody else's formation. It doesn't make any sense to me. Jansen is built as a frontline tank, as he should be, and he should be on the front line. It's just a safety precaution, just in case something goes wrong somewhere. If that something is maybe something that went wrong on someone else's team, Having Jansen on the front line still gives me a chance for my Belager to live longer. If he can resist the boss's oblivion, maybe he'll get off a second attack and compensate for the problem on someone else's team as well. So this is a big one in my book. Jansen should always be on the front line. Okay, the next one is another speed issue that um, can trip people up sometimes, and that's making your Colleen too fast. I believe the guides say that she should not be over 191. Again, I would always take a little bit of a buffer, so she shouldn't be anywhere above the high 180s. If your Colleen is too fast, she will act before the boss, which will result in a cut later in the fight. And again, it could ultimately cause the boss to get an extra turn and strip your Belager, or it could cause the Lawrence to act out of order. A lot of different wonky things can happen when your speed tuning is not correct. Along those lines, your Colleen should be faster than your Lauren. Now, logically, this one probably doesn't make a huge difference. Um, having Colleen faster than Lauren basically just means that Lauren does a little bit more damage. Uh, I can't actually think of a, another good reason why she needs to be faster. Maybe, maybe the people who designed the team have a good reason, and I just can't figure it out. But even so, even if that's the only reason, why aren't we maximizing every bit of damage we can get? Again, it's all, all about derp protection because it's not just your team. Somebody else's team could derp, and the more damage you can do, the better. Okay, the last one is if your Belager, actually, we've got two left. So if your Belager does not quite have enough damage, you know he's supposed to be at 32,000. Let's say he's at 31,500, and you try and make up the difference by putting your Lauren on a crit damage build. That's perfectly fine. What it really is, is you need to do 140,000 damage. The boss has 420,000 HP on each jump. So if everybody does 140,000 total damage, they've all done their part and the boss dies. Doesn't matter if 20,000 of that comes from Lauren or 7,000 of it comes from Lauren, which uh, I say 20,000 because that's what my Lauren, who is on, a, she's actually on a crit rate build, which we'll talk about in a second. Uh, 20,000 is what my Lauren does with her skill too. Uh, excuse me, with her skill one. Her skill two is actually a little bit less damage. But anyway, it doesn't matter where the damage comes from. It only matters that you do enough damage to hold up your end. Here's the catch. Putting your Lauren on a crit damage build means having enough crit rate to crit 100% of the time if you're counting that into your damage calculation. So with 42% crit rate buff for our Belagers, they only need to have 58%. But our Lorens are not benefiting from the Kali buff. 
our Lorens are only benefiting from the common crit rate lead, whether it's a, the Hua that I'm using or a Jeanette or whatever. So when you're putting your Loren in a crit damage build, she needs 81 crit rate. If you can't get her to 81 crit rate, use a crit rate slot four and use some higher attack subs. And this is what I've done right here. So mine is in a crit rate slot four so that I could reach that 81%. I'm actually at 89, but so I could reach that 81% threshold. And then I have a lot of big crit damage and attack subs. I'm also on uh, slot two, yeah, slot two. So I'm actually, my Lauren is attack, crit damage, HP. She's very slow, but it doesn't matter because she's speed tuned. Okay, I'll close out with just a couple of tips. Uh, one is do not use unnecessary transmogrifications. Doesn't make a huge difference. All the monsters should still act in order, but it does change the synchronizing a little bit, which can result in a slightly slower run. I mean, we're only talking about a couple tenths of a second at that point. Uh, this is more a, a trick so that you don't get kicked from groups. Because if we go back to the first thing I said, when I look at the timing of a run, I want to see that it's in that range it's supposed to be. So if your Belager or your Lauren is transmogged and that causes our run to go to 28.01 seconds, the two tenths of a second doesn't matter to me at all. But what does matter is that now I'm thinking that there might be a fail. So I'm either going to have to go look at your entire team or find another group. And the last thing I'm going to say is, and this one's not a piece of advice, it's really just uh, passing along something I've been told. I haven't tested it, so I can't recommend it. But it's to make your Dagora faster than your Jansen, but slower than your Belager. So the reason for this is if your Dagora, excuse me, if your Belager doesn't finish off the boss and your Jansen acts before the boss acts, then Colleen is not dead. And remember, again, that Jansen third skill, it's increasing the allies attack bar by 30% per the number of revived allies. So if your Colleen is not dead when Jansen resurrects, then your Belager and your Lauren's attack bars don't increase enough. Okay, for, so for the last thing in today's video, I just want to dispel one of the common myths that actually intimidates people from building their BJR5 teams. If you've heard that you need to have max towers, that's not true. Having max towers lowers the rune requirement for building your team. If you're using the optimizer to build your team, to calculate effective HP and to calculate damage, the optimizer is going to account for your arena towers already. Now, do you need to have some towers done? Yeah, I don't know that. Well, put it this way. If you've never leveled any of your towers, you're too early in the game to have good enough runes to make up for the fact that you don't have level towers. But if you're somewhere late mid game, early late game, and maybe your towers are at seven, seven, eight, or something like that, well, what does a tower do? So think about common attack. A common attack tower is plus 2%. Let's uh, actually, let's bring our game back up for just a moment. So a common attack tower is plus 2% attack, right? Well, my Belager has 790 base attack. So the common attack tower is actually plus 15.8 attack. That means that if I'm looking at this chart, and I see that 240 crit damage and 1,750 attack is 32,000 damage. Well, if that's my goal, then all I have to do is add 18 attack to that to make up for the one missing tower level. So I need 240 crit damage and 1,770. And this plus, of course. So plus 1,770 attack to get to that 32,000. Now that's easy on a, a, you know, if your common attack is nine. What if your fire attack is seven and your common attack is seven? Well, what you're actually missing is 13% total attack because it's 2.1% attack for every fire tower level, 2% attack for every common tower. So if you want to get technical, you're missing 12.3. I'm just rounding off. So again, we go back. What's 13% of 790? Um, about 110, give or take. So we need 110 more attack than we would have otherwise needed. So coming back to our crit damage chart here, 250 crit damage and plus 1650 with max towers is enough. So what you need is 250 crit damage and plus 1760 to make up for not having your towers maxed. So don't be intimidated by the fact that your towers are not maxed. Just understand that there's a slightly higher rune requirement. The same thing is true for your effective HP. 
If you're missing a couple of levels of your HP tower, then it means you need an extra 4% base HP to that effect. Okay, so that's it for today's video, guys. If I missed anything, if you've seen any other crazy mistakes, other than the obvious stuff of just, you know, somebody who didn't even try to build, but kind of the more obscure things, the little things, speed tuning, things that kind of slip through the cracks, please post them in the comments down below. So thanks for watching, guys, and we'll see you next time. Hey guys, if you enjoyed the video, please pop that subscribe button over on the left. Uh, it shows me that you enjoyed the video, but more importantly, it shows me that you found the information useful and hopefully it helped you in your gameplay. So here's the deal. You pop subscribe and I'll keep popping out content. Thanks guys.